Good afternoon. My name is Eran uh, Meshorer. I'm from the Department of Genetics here at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, and before I welcome Professor Aaron Chekhanover, we're going to listen to uh, some music, two arias from two famous operas, Verdi's Il Trovatore and Bizet's Carmen, performed by Sonia Mazar and Iris Brill. Sonia Mazar is a pianist, singing coach, and a faculty member at the Jerusalem Rubik Academy. She performed in uh, cultural centers, festivals, and concerts halls in Italy and Israel. Sonia is a vocal coach at the Rubin Academy as well as in the New Israeli Opera. Mezzo-soprano Iris Brill is a fourth year student at the Jerusalem Rubin Music Academy and performs regularly with orchestras and ensembles throughout the country. Please welcome Sonia Mazar and Iris Brill.
very much. I'm now delighted to present Nobel laureate and distinguished Technion Professor Aaron Chekhanover. Aaron Chekhanover received his MSc and MD from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem as a graduate student with Avram Hershko at the Technion and in collaboration with Irvin Rose from Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. They discovered active protein degradation by an attachment of a small protein called ubiquitin. They deciphered the mechanism of ubiquitin attachment, described the general functions of the system, and proposed a model which depicts that the ubiquitin modification serves as a recognition signal for a downstream protease. These discoveries completely changed the way we think about protein degradation from a passive disposal process to an active, carefully regulated mechanism. As a postdoctoral fellow with Harvey Lodish at MIT, Chekhanover continued to work on active protein degradation and the protein ubiquitin system, making additional important discoveries. It is now clear that active protein degradation plays crucial roles in numerous cellular processes, including cell cycle regulation, apoptosis, transcription, translation, and whatnot. And aberrations in this system underlie the pathogenesis of many diseases, including malignancies and neurodegenerative disorders. Consequently, the system has become an important platform for drug discovery and development. Chekhanover is the recipient of numerous prizes and awards, including notably the Albert Lasker Award in 2000, shared with Avram Hershko and Alexander Varshavsky from Caltech, and the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2004, shared with Avram Hershko and Irvin Rose. Aaron Chekhanover has been selected as a foreign member of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA, of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities, among many others. Today, Aaron Chekhanover will tell us about the personalized medicine revolution. Are we going to cure all diseases, and at what price? Please welcome Aaron Chekhanover. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Jerusalem, to my alma mater university. I am also interested in war, like my predecessor, but a very different war. And that's the war against diseases. Whether it's more interesting than the other war that you heard about or not, that's up you to judge. So everybody is talking uh, about personalized medicine. And, uh, but very little is known, even to the experts, and we are still on the road. And I want to give you my perspective to it. Uh, mostly an historical perspective, how it all started, what brought about the thinking that the current state of drug development and our approach to diseases is not satisfactory. It's good, but it's not satisfactory. And what led to the beginning of this major revolution that is going to change completely the face of medicine in the next decades to come. So let's uh, really go to the history, because I think there, there, there is much um, um, to learn from the history. I just wanted to make a, a short note. I'm not going to talk. I'm both a physician and a scientist. And I'm kind of uh, semi-torn between the two worlds, though the two are related to one another. But to be a physician, you need to practice medicine. You have to see patients. And to be a scientist, uh, you need to devote a lot of your time to experimental uh, work. Um, so today I'll talk to you about medicine, and tomorrow we are going to have uh, several hours of discussion, so if you want, I shall be able to discuss with you our own discovery, which actually led to medicine um, in the recent years, and there are numerous drugs that have been developed based on our discovery. Some of them are very successful in the market already, some of them are in the pipeline in different stages of development. So tomorrow will be more kind of a free uh, question answers, discussions uh, type of uh, encounter between us. So whoever wants to come is welcome. So the will of people has always been and is still and even stronger to remain young forever. Being young is something young and beautiful. But with it also to be healthy, to be healthy. So. When people are aging, most think one of the most important things that bothers them is to have high quality of life, not to succumb uh, 
to diseases. So being young and being healthy have always gone uh, uh, hand by hand. And along with this dream always came the thought, wow, maybe there will be one day in which there will be no diseases anymore. The Hebrew University will shut down its uh, medical school. The Hadassah Hospital will be converted into a concert hall or a museum. And the so will happen to other famous medical schools and hospitals in the world. And we shall live in a disease-free world. Is this dream realistic? I mean, we are not used to it, but we are supposed to dream. And actually, if you think about scientists and physicians, that is exactly what they are fighting for, to eradicate diseases. And the matter of the fact that we have eradicated many diseases, especially in the developed world. Think about polio. Think about infectious diseases. Think about cholera. Well, they are coming back here and there. So why not to learn from the experience of the past to take the whole textbook of medicine and to say, let's move along the pages, and gradually we shall cut the pages one by one and eradicate all diseases. Is this unrealistic? Well, we are not here to prophesy. Uh, my profession is not uh, being a prophet or a predictor, but uh, let's judge this uh, idea in light um, of what we know. Obviously, such a dream has enormous predictions behind it. Think about a world that is uh, disease-free. Disease-free means that we live forever. Well, maybe not forever, but 400 years, 500 years. And if we are living in a good state of health, then people will continue to work. They will never go out to pension. If they will not go, out, go to pension, then what will happen to the young ones who will substitute them in working places? Or we shall generate more working places? What about the world population? You know, the world population more than tripled in the 20th century. And gradually, people are starting to think about shortage, shortage of resources, resources of energy, contamination, what we are doing to the planet. So here comes also, you know, the scientists are thinking like scientists. You know, they have a target. They want to cure cancer. They want to cure Alzheimer's. They want to cure other neurodegenerative diseases. But there are implications to this will even behind the, just the pure work on the bench. And this implication are not necessarily in line with the initial dream of let's do it, let's cure it. Maybe they are even contradictory. So we may think even that there will be a point that um, governors, politicians, even ethicists and religious clergymen will tell to the scientists, well, we have to stop because the world population is going to explode. We are not going to have jobs anymore. The planet is going to be contaminated in an irreversible way. We are going to consume all energy sources. Well, again, I'm not here to tell you about a nightmare or about discussions, but we have always to think as a scientist that our work always spills over in a big way well beyond the desk on which we are carrying the experiment. And I think that it's a healthy approach to science for physicians, for scientists. And we are going to talk about bioethical implications of the personalized medicine revolution, because it's not always the experiment that we are doing that matters. Well, it does matter. But we have to bear in mind, as citizens of society and of the community, that there are other implications to what we are doing, always. So let's go to personalized medicine. Let's just start to roll to roll down. So here is one dream. This um, is the Time magazine cover from the late 70s and early uh, 80s, uh, after the discovery or the hypothesis by Judah Folkman, a Harvard professor, who said, why to hit cancer directly? Cancer is a too complicated disease. Well, there are people who will study it. Let's do something else. Let's hit the blood supply to the cancer the blood vessels that supply oxygen and nutrients to the cancer. When cancers start to grow, the cells are dividing rapidly. People noted that they draw behind them blood vessels that will carry on, will bring in nutrients, oxygen and nutrients. So the idea was, let's learn what are the factors that are secreted by the cancer cells or by normal cells that lead to growth of blood vessels, and let's combat them. By doing so, we shall suffocate and starve the cancer to death. It was a fantastic idea by Judah Folkman. What he wanted to do is to hit angiogenesis, angio, 
Is blood vessels Genesis is formation? The first book in the Bible, Genesis. And uh, people liked it, but it never took off. Well, it took off only partially. There are some drugs today, some antibodies that are hitting growth factors that lead to growth of blood vessels. But at the end, it turned out that cancer is a much more sophisticated disease, and it can live even under hypoxic condition. You can cut the blood vessels, not completely. You can shorten it. You can, shorten it. You can really uh, limit blood supply, and somehow the cells will find a way around. And we'll talk about the different strategies that cancers are evolving in order to fight all kinds of drugs and whatever people are inventing. But you see, this is belong also to a dream, and actually a dream that comes out of a, an oversimplistic approach to biological processes. Biological processes are far more complex than we think of them. And this idea became just yet another idea that took off, but only to a limited extent. But in order to free the world from diseases, actually we don't have to go to medical schools and to laboratories to learn very sophisticated medicine. Much of prevention, much of what we can do about diseases is at our hand, and it has nothing to do with medicine, but it has to do just with our own behavior. So look at if you are going, you are going to enter into a modern hospital these days. And this hospital can be in Kyoto, in Osaka, in Beijing, in Taiwan, in Shinchu, in Bombay, wherever you want, into a modern hospital, you will quickly realize that about 50% of the patient, about 50% of the patient, should not be there if they would have behaved properly. They, or the government, or their environment. So about 50%, and even more of the diseases, and it will be more of the diseases, are preventable. So think about obesity. Obesity is a plague. It's an epidemic in the world, mostly in the Western world. And obesity brings with it numerous other diseases. It brings with it heart diseases and brain diseases and kidney diseases. But mostly, and most recently, we realize that obesity brings with it cancer. There is a tight junction, a real tight junction, a high frequency of malignancies in obese patients. Now scientists are started, starting even to understand, to decipher, the underlying mechanism between obesity and cancer. And the underlying mechanism is inflammation. Chronic inflammation has been known for years to cause cancer. And obese people are known to have chronic, subtle, subclinical inflammation. They are all the time under an inflammatory process. If you look for inflammatory mediators, cytokines, interleukins, if you are looking into infiltration of inflammatory cells into the fatty tissue, you will always find traces of uh, uh, inflammatory cells and, uh, and mediators in obese patients. And people are surmising now, researchers, that obesity and cancer are going hand by hand, linked together via the chain of inflammation. So obesity, in many ways, is a preventable disease. From time to time, it's hard, but it's preventable. Think about smoking in the broad sense. Smoking is certainly preventable. You just don't go to the shop and you don't buy cigarettes. And again, smoking behind, beyond being probably number one cause of uh, lung cancer is also not only burning the lungs, but also burning the heart the vessels, the blood vessels, the kidneys, and chronic smoking is associated with chronic diseases, chronic and debilitating diseases of numerous organs. It's really deleterious to smoke. Smoking is preventable. Infectious diseases in many ways are also preventable. They are preventable at all levels. In countries in which hygiene level is low, it can be raised, learning from the Western world, Infections in hospital can be prevented to a large extent, not always, by the proper behavior of the clinical staff. And now we are emphasizing it day in and day out about cleanliness and hygiene in the hospitals. Cleaning the environment is very important to remove parasites that are transmitting diseases. Infectious diseases in many ways, AIDS, for example, we learned a lot about AIDS, about the transmission of AIDS, the sensitivity of the virus is preventable. 
by proper behavior, by proper uh, uh, preventive measures for those who prefer certain types of uh, modes of sex. It's perfectly okay, but it is nevertheless preventable, and so on and so forth. So learning about diseases brought a lot of knowledge of how to prevent them. The environment. Well, the environment is at the hands of uh, regulations by governments, by uh, different uh, authorities. I remember the first days where once Germany was united, East and West Germany, what the West Germans found on the other side was horrendous, a neglected industry that didn't care at all about the environment, contaminated the soil, contaminated the rivers, contaminated water sources, and again, proper behavior, which is absolutely um, uh, implementable, can prevent many of the diseases. We know in Israel, some of contaminated areas, two major cities in Israel were declared last week as contaminated cities by obviously very strict uh, uh, criteria. Contaminated uh, uh, places are leading, are the cause of many diseases, respiratory diseases, malignancies, and others. And genetic diseases, this is the topic of my talk, you will see that even them, even genetic diseases can be prevented uh, or will be, we shall be able to prevent them in the future. So you see, we don't need much knowledge to cure disease, and it also makes much more logic to prevent disease. It's much cheaper, it's much healthier. Why to treat a disease if we can prevent it at the first place? So let's go, at the end of the day, medicine of today is made of uh, two major arms. One arms are the devices. We are using a lot of devices, imaging devices, X-ray, MRI, CAT scans, uh, surgery, uh, all kinds of stents and uh, different catheters in order to um, do all kinds of procedures. And we are using drugs. Drugs are a heavy arm of medicine. And let's talk about drugs because the revolution of personalized medicine it has mostly to do with drugs. And I think that looking at the history of drugs will um, give us a little bit of a glimpse of um, um, where we are heading. So let's talk about drug discovery at the 21st century. This is the century that we are currently in. But in order to understand it, we have to go to the previous century that we just left about 12 years ago and see what happened there. By the way, the 20th century has been the most successful century, at least by certain criteria that our physicians and statisticians are using. Think about life expectancy. Until the turn of the 20th century, the turn of the 19th century into the 20th century, about 112 years ago, the average lifespan of people in the world was about 50 years. People at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 20th century lived around 50 years. Now, the old Egyptians and Greeks that lived about 4,000 years ago lived around 25 to 30 years. So it took people almost 4,000 years to add barely 20 years to the life expectancy. So be between 2000 and 3000 BC to almost 2000 AC, life expectancy of people grew increased by about 20 years, from 30 to 50. If you look at the old Greeks, Archimedes, Cleopatra, the Egyptians, Tutankhamun, all these people lived around 25 to 30 years. In the 20th century alone, 100 years merely, and less than that, we increased life expectancy by additional 30 years. More than 50% that was accumulated along the 4,000 years that preceded the 20th century. And we can attribute it exactly to different factors. We can attribute it to hygiene. We can attribute it to our understanding in nutrition, cholesterol. We can attribute it to medicine, to the development of antibiotics. We are going to talk about antibiotics. To eradication of acute infections. People, millions of people died uh, because of epidemics uh, uh, beforehand. And now we have immunizations. And we have uh, antibiotics because of uh, the development of imaging technology, initially X-ray and then MRI and CAT scan. Surgery, we, we were able to develop surgery 
very, uh, in a very sophisticated way. Again, because of antibiotics, surgeons are not afraid anymore to enter, to invade into the body, to open the body, and then they can protect the patient from um, um, infections by antibiotics. And then imaging technology, we are able to look today into pathologies in a much more accurate way than we used even during after the invention of uh, Röntgen. By the way, Konrad Röntgen was the first to win the Nobel Prize in physics. It was the first Nobel Prize in 1901. And the technology was holding for almost 75 years, until the late 70s when uh, CAT scan and then MRI entered and made imaging much more uh, uh, sophisticated. So all those technologies that all have to do with our health, one way or another, uh, added 30 years to our lifespan. With that came a price. You all know that there are no free lunches. And cancer, and mostly neurodegenerative diseases, popped up. People at the turn of the previous century did not die of cancer. Very few of them. Why they didn't die of cancer? Because they didn't live long enough in order to have cancer. So there was cancer, but it was very rare. Cancer is a disease of the sixth and seventh and eighth decade of life. I happen to be the president of the Israel Cancer Society, so I know the numbers exactly. There is cancer in children, but 1%, 1.5% of all cases, very low. Cancer is an age-related disease, which mechanistically, obviously, is very interesting. Why is it? What happens to the biological mechanism that fail after successive work of six and seven decades. Alzheimer, neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson, dementia, which are burdening the Western economy in a big way, is a disease of the advanced age, of the six and seven and eighth and nine decades of life. People did not die of Alzheimer 115 years ago. Again, they didn't live long enough to have it. So are we going to cure all diseases? You have the answer. I don't know. 50 years, 100 years ago, I didn't know that we are going to die of cancer, if I would have lived at that time. And I didn't know that we are going to die of neurodegenerative disease. So nowadays, I don't know what we are going to die of 100 years from now. Maybe something else is waiting for us behind the corner. So if we want to learn from history, the answer to the question whether we are going to live in a disease-free world is not known. It's up to prophets, and we are not prophets, we are scientists. So let's go back to the bench. Now let's look at drug development at the 20th century. Now again, the 20th century is characterized by drug development in the most scientific way that we have ever known. Until then, there were drugs. You know, the old Greek used drugs, the Chinese used drugs, Chinese traditional medicine. There were drugs all over the world. The old Egyptians used drugs, and I'm going to point out to you on one of them shortly. But there was not, the world of science was not there, so the whole community and the communication was not there. So everybody will agree that this is indeed the drug for. Let's say aspirin, that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Aspirin that removes pain and lowers fever. Everybody knows that if you go to a pharmacy, and it doesn't matter whether it's in Rio de Janeiro, um, um, Chongqing in China, Tokyo, Shinchu in Taiwan, doesn't matter. You buy aspirin, it always will be the same chemical. It always will be with the same characteristic, with the same milligram amount of the chemical if it's not counterfeited. And it always will have the same effect on most of the population, not on all of them. So we are now exchanging information internationally. When a new drug is coming now, or we are developing a new drug, I develop now a drug in my laboratory. There are experiments that are done initially on animals and then on human beings, phase one and phase two and phase three, and it's double-blinded, so the patient doesn't know what he gets and the physician that gives him the drug doesn't know what he gets, and it's being conducted in 75 different centers all over the world, the data are collected blindly, and only in the last day, everything is opened, and statistics are done, and we know whether we have a new drug or we don't, whether it's not more beneficial than the previous one. And we always compare it to the previous one, and we developed a scientific-based, accurate method 
of developing drugs. This is, happened only in the 20th century, and only, I would say, starting in the 30s or 40s even. So the whole, my whole talk is basically limited to six years, because until then, there was erratic, limited knowledge coming from all kinds of non-scientific sources. But when we are talking about the drug industry, basically every drug that you pull out today from the, from the shelf in the pharmacy is a product of this experimental approach. I'm not talking that the source of it could have gone well deep into the history, but putting it on the, on, in, on the shelf in any pharmacy in the world, or almost any pharmacy in the world, is the result of complete agreement in the scientific community that this is how this drug should look like. So many milligrams of this purified chemical, packed so and so, should be taken twice a day, per kilogram body weight, everybody talks the same language. So let's talk about these 60, 70 years. So the first revolution, when the first drugs were introduced, were what I call the era of incidental discoveries. So these were discoveries that were made by chance. People were not researching. They didn't mean to discover what they discovered at the end. But nevertheless, they discovered majestic drugs. And let's take just one of them, aspirin. Aspirin is probably the drug that has been used and will be used. It's not only to the present, but in the future, weight-wise, in tons, more than any other drug in the history of the pharmacology. Tons and tons and tons are being consumed by patients worldwide, and the use of this drug is increasing daily, all the time, because we still know very little about the drug. So the source of aspirin goes back 4,000 years ago to the old Egyptians in the willow barks that grew um, along the Nile River, the Egyptians realized that if you chew the leaves, there is a bitter material. But if you can overcome the feeling of the bitterness, it will take away pain. There is a pain reliever in the willow barks that grew over the, the banks of the Nile River. And then for 1,000 years, it was forgotten. And it was taken out by a French pharmacist in the 19th century, by Charles Gerhardt who made it less bitter by acetylating it. You see the formula is a very simple one. It's acetylsalicylic acid. Very simple uh, compound. You can synthesize it easily in your basement. Every undergraduate can synthesize it easily in the basement. And uh, then it was forgotten again. And in the beginning of the 20th century, Felix Hoffman, who was a pharmacist that worked in Bayer. Bayer is a German pharma company. His father had a disease called rheumatoid arthritis. Now, rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory disease that affects the joints. The joints of the hands and the legs and the feet are inflamed and, and uh, swollen and, and hurting. And the people are basically debilitating. They, they cannot move. They cannot do anything. It's a very it's a debilitating disease. And uh, they cannot button their, sh their shirts. They cannot uh, dry themselves after a shower. And um, he remembered the work of uh, Charles Gerhard, that there is some pain reliever. And he decided to relieve the pain of his father. And he went to the basement and synthesized aspirin and gave it to his father. And lo and behold, his father was not only cured from the pain, was not only relieved from the pain, but cured from the inflammation. So what Felix Hoffman discovered is that the drug that he gave to his father relieved his pain, but also was anti-inflammatory. It took people another uh, 70 years to, this, to even to, to get a Nobel Prize for the, to discover the mechanism of action of aspirin as an anti-inflammatory uh, drug. It inhibits uh, the synthesis of uh, inflammatory mediator, uh, cyclooxygenase. It's an enzyme that, uh, that uh, synthesizes uh, inflammatory mediators. But um, I will not go into this um, uh, uh, Nobel Prize. But then he went to the company, Felix Hoffman, and told them, listen, I discovered the drug. Why won't you produce it? And Bayer accepted it. They, produced, they started to produce the drug that has become known in, along the years as Bayer aspirin. But now every, everybody can synthesize it. And there is no patent of it. You can buy a kilo for a dollar and use it for the rest of your life. But meanwhile, people discovered many other aspects of aspirin. So aspirin is taking away fever. It takes away inflammation. 
And it also prevents, and this is a discovery of the last 30 years, it also prevents platelets aggregation. Platelets are the small blood cells that cause blood coagulation. So it's an ideal drug to prevent a secondary myocardial infarction, heart attack. Now you can imagine heart attack is the most common disease in the Western world and now coming up also in Asia, in modern countries in Asia. So every patient that is suffering from heart attack will be recommended if he can, if he doesn't suffer side effects from the drug, will be recommended by his physician to take aspirin. Now you can understand why the drug is being consumed in an increasing amount and in tons, because all myocardial infarctions in the world basically are taking it. Now people are starting to think, and there are already data, that it can also prevent heart attack. So now it's open for the entire population. And then, because it's anti-inflammatory, and because I told you about the linkage between inflammation and cancer, people are starting to think, and we know it already, that it can prevent cancer, at least certain types of cancer. Among them, a very common cancer, which is cancer of the large intestine, colorectal carcinoma. So many people in the world, including myself, are taking aspirin for many years as a preventive drug. Not that I'm recommending you to do it, because aspirin has side effects. It causes bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract. I'm not here as a physician to recommend you any drug, but I can tell you that millions of people are taking it also voluntarily, or as the physicians call it, prophylactically, in an inhibitory way. Now, aspirin is really the most, I think it's the most successful drug ever made. Chance, Egyptians, Gerald Char, Ch uh, uh, Gerald Sherhard, Felix Hoffman, his father, synthesis in the basement, successful, go to the company, tell them to do it, no research, no nothing, all based on history and very little primitive chemistry. By chance, the most successful drug of the pharma industry has come to the market. I'll give you another example, penicillin, the first antibiotic, complete chance. This was discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming and was later on synthesized by Sir Ernst Shanks and Flory. Complete chance, uh, Sir Alexander Fleming, who received the Nobel Prize for this discovery, along with Chain and Flory, was a microbiologist. And for those of you who are in microbiology, bacteria are growing on dish, on petri dishes, which are rich in nutrients. So you see here the smear of the bacteria. It was August of 23, this month. And Alexander Fleming took a vacation. He went for a vacation and he forgot a Petri dish on the table, uncovered. Typically, the Petri dish should be covered so it will not be contaminated by spores of fungi and should be put in the refrigerator so the bacteria that grew will now stop growing because bacteria don't grow at four degrees. They grow at 37. So he did two mistakes that brought the world Something unbelievable, the first antibiotics. One mistake, leaving a dish on the table. Second mistake, leaving it unclosed, uncovered, open. He came back from the vacation and he saw that the fungus grew on the dish. And the fungus was penicillin, penicillum, the genus penicillum. And what a microbiologist would do, like myself, immediately when he looks at it, I grow bacteria in my lab all the time, you take the dish, you throw it away. Not Alexander Fleming, he looked at it, and what he found, he looked, he saw that this is the penicillin, and here the colony of the fungus, and around it there is a halo. And he noticed that the bacteria don't make it all the way, they don't grow all the way, to touch the border, the margin of the colony of the fungus, but they stop in a distance. And he surmised that the penicillin secretes some material that is antibacterial, antibios, against life, bios is life, that doesn't allow the bacteria to grow all the way to the fungus. Let's make a, short, a long story short, it was indeed right, the, the fungus secreted penicillin. The penicillin was isolated, was used as an antibiotic. And then people realized, wow, if a fungus can secrete an antibacterial material, maybe another fungus can secrete another one. And then Selman Waxman discovered the streptomycin, and the face of medicine changed completely. With the discovery of antibiotic, I cannot attribute to antibiotic five years 
or seven years in the 30 years added to lifespan, because we cannot make these calculations. But there is no doubt that antibiotics added a significant chunk of time to our lifespan. I don't know, I don't think that there is anybody sitting in this hall that didn't took one dose of antibiotic for several days during his lifetime, let it be for sore throat, for you know, wood infection, for anything. So this just gives you an idea of how widespread is the distribution and the utilization of antibiotic. Again, serendipity, no research. When he left the lab on Friday, he didn't imagine that when he'll come back after a week, the world, the face of the world will be different. He didn't know about it, he didn't predict it, he had no idea that fungi secrete antibacterial materials. Second revolution, nowadays we are still in it. The second revolution reflected the development of chemistry, the huge development of chemistry. Chemists can synthesize for you almost any compound that you want, unless it violates the laws of thermodynamics. It can take them 40 steps, 50 steps, 70 steps, doesn't matter. You show them, they can design it from different precursors and put compounds together. Along the way, millions of compounds were synthesized. Most of them were not used. And then people came to the idea, let's make a use of them again. Let's take all the compounds, divide them by families. You know, it doesn't matter which families. And try them by chance. Try them by high throughput brute force screening. We can grow cells now. It came together with the development in biology. We can grow cells now in small wells, let's say cancer cells. Let's take millions of compounds and put a drop of each of them on a well in which cancer cells are growing. And we'll see which compound inhibits the growth of the cell. Doesn't matter how it affects the cell, what mechanism it uh, inhibits, signal transduction, cell surface receptor, DNA synthesis, chelation, doesn't matter. Let's just see. We have a million compound library. People made libraries. Let's take the library and screen. We have no question. It's not intelligent, but nevertheless, it's useful. Because we shall find a lead or several leads that then we shall improve. Then we shall make them more soluble, add uh, um, um, membrane soluble groups, uh, membrane solubilizing group, and so on and so forth. All kinds of groups, reactive groups, and so on and so forth. It's like having a a, a keyhole, and if you have a collection of 1,000 keys, there is a chance that one key out of 1,000 will open for you the keyhole, even though you have no clue how the key looks like and how the keyhole looks like. But there is a chance. And indeed, many drugs have been discovered along the very recent years. I'm talking about the last decade, extremely successful drug, simply by screening and then improving. The system is very expensive because also the regulation has become very tight um, of different agencies, the FDA mostly and the European um, uh, drug authorities. It takes about, on the average, without going into numbers, into accurate numbers, about a billion dollars to develop a single drug, to bring a single drug to the market. And I'll bring you just uh, one example of a drug that brought like that. It's statin. Statin are anti-cholesterol agents. They are reducing the level of cholesterol. And as you all know, cholesterol is the cause of heart attacks by occluding the coronary arteries. These are the arteries that bring blood to the heart muscle itself. Cholesterol is accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. And at the end, it occludes the blood flow to the heart, and the patient succumbs to a heart attack. Everybody says, wow, he was healthy. He was running marathon until yesterday, and he died suddenly. No, he was not healthy until yesterday. He has been accumulating cholesterol for the last three decades, gradually occluding the coronary arteries. The last moment, when the last occlusion occurred, when the last drop of blood could flow through the occluded artery, this was the moment of truth of a disease that has evolved there for 30 years. Now, statins are derived from a fungus. It's a natural material. And Akira Endo, a Japanese uh, pharmacist that worked in a pharma company, screened, developed an assay and screened for anti-cholesterol drugs. And the drug inhibits the synthesis of cholesterol in a critical step. Cholesterol is being made by several steps. Uh, this was discovered by Konrad Bloch, a German, Jewish, American scientist that won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway. And 
Statins are stopping the biosynthesis of cholesterol, reduce cholesterol level, and with that reduce tremendously the morbidity and mortality from heart attack. The impact, the economic impact of this drug is uh, unmeasurable. We are talking about billions and billions and billions of accumulating dollars. People believe also that taking statins is preventing also neurodegenerative disorders and even heart attacks. So you don't, even, you don't only treat people with, that underwent a heart attack, but you treat them also preventively. But again, the whole issue of preventive medicine, we'll discuss it tomorrow, is kind of uh, up in the air because insurance companies don't want to fund um, uh, preventive drugs because it costs them a lot of money. People are afraid of side effects. You need to be disciplined. You say, well, I'm healthy. Why should I take anything? I don't want, we can discuss it tomorrow. But even for the sick people, probably I, I chose purposefully aspirin and antibiotics and statins. This, uh, these are drugs that have left behind them and are still leaving behind them the biggest impact on our lives. This drug is truly, you know, it took away, you know, it, it saved the lives of millions and millions of people, truly saved the lives of millions of millions of people and saved the economies of the, the developing world billions and billions of dollars. Now we are into the last revolution that we are now entering, and that's the revolution of personalized medicine. And actually, it's four P's. It's not only personalized, but it, because it's personalized, it's also predictive, preventive, and participatory. So remember, four P's, and the four P's, the credit should go to Lee Hood, the father of this uh, prophecy, of this uh, revolution in many ways. And the revolution will be completely based on our DNA initially, not only. Initially on our DNA, on our own personal, individual DNA of me and you and you and you and you and you and everybody that sits here in the hall. And the revolution started even without knowing about 20 years ago when people decided to sequence the human genome. The first human genome sequencing, first I mean one person. The human genome of a single person. Um, was completed in April of uh, 2000, and it, co it took about 10 years, development of all kinds of technologies, mostly computational technologies, and it cost close to $700 million. Let's cut it short. We are now, in August of 2012, approaching very quickly the ability to sequence the same human genome in about 15 to 20 minutes, and in a cost of about 100 to $200 cheaper than a CAT scan or an MRI. We are not there yet. We are now at, a, at an order of magnitude of few days and about $10,000. But remember, few days and $10,000 compared to 10 years ago, 10 years and $700 million, it's all, the huge jump has already been made. We are beyond the big jump. We have some small leaps to do now to get it into few minutes and about two to $300. Now, the human genome will give us uh, a lot of information about uh, what's going on there. But remember, we are not made and diseases are not caused by genes. Diseases are caused by proteins. And proteins are the products of genes. But on the way, there are several steps. There, are, there is the DNA, and then there is the RNA. And then on top of the RNA comes the protein. But proteins also undergo different changes. They get oxidized, they get ubiquitinated, phosphorylated, amidated, acetylated. So the world is going to be much more complex. But the secret at the end is going to be at the protein level. But the beginning, in order to understand at least mutations, we need to have the DNA at hand. Now, the DNA, even the DNA at the DNA level, we are at a problem. But the problem is going to be solved because, again, of the massive approach to the ability to sequence. And the problem with the DNA is the multigenic diseases. Because initially, when I was a medical student, we were smiling. Everybody was happy. One disease, one gene, one mutation. If there is a tay Zucks disease, it's probably, or, or Gaucher disease, there is a mutation in an enzyme called glucocerebrosidase. And we didn't know the mutation at that time because we couldn't sequence DNA in the 70s when I was a medical student. But we assumed that there will be one mutation in one enzyme. Now we realize that, first of all, even for Gaucher disease, there can be numerous mutations in the enzyme that inactivate it. And some will inactivate it completely. Some will activate it partially. But the problem for us is not the 
single gene diseases. The problem for us are the multigenic diseases, like heart diseases, like uh, mostly uh, mental diseases, autism and other mental diseases. There, the picture becomes very complex because multiple genes are being involved. And remember that multiple genes have also different penetrants. So we don't know who is the commander and who is the soldier in this fighting unit, who plays a major role and who plays a minor role. And if the soldier all of a sudden became stronger, he becomes the commander because the gene can change penetrance and so on and so forth. But I believe that once we shall have mass information, if we shall sequence, let's say, I don't know, 100,000 depressive patients and 100,000 autistic and 100,000 schizophrenic and 100,000, whatever, we shall have a landscape. We shall know how the DNA looks like, at least at a superficial um, uh, 30,000 feet eyeball inspection, and then we shall be able from there to start to take steps into the real culprits, which are the proteins. So the road is very long and bumpy, but nevertheless, at least we have a roadmap. And we are starting, not only that we have a roadmap, but we are starting to talk the language. We are talking the language of genomics, of sequencing. We are talking the language of proteomics, of analyzing um, 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 the, the proteome. We are talking the language of metabolomics. We want to go beyond the proteins and to understand the products of the protein, the enzymatic products, all kinds of small molecules, lipid, phosphorylated sugars, um, and nucleic acid, and so on. So we are talking about metabolomics, and we are talking about dynamics. We are talking about following the patient, following the treatment. So we have a patient, we take the sequence, we take the protein that is the culprit, then we start to treat, then we can follow. This, this, these treatments are going to, these diagnostics, sophisticated diagnostics, are going to be part of our armamentarium in the hospital. We are going to use them. I don't know how many of you are medical students? Medical students here? No medical students. Wow. I am a minority in this audience. Um, but in patients, in hospitals, we are following by the day. We are taking, we want to follow the disease, whether the disease exacerbates or whether the disease phases out. And we are doing dynamics, and we shall do dynamics on the proteomes and on the metabolome and on the lipidome and on the glycome and on the, on the, on the genome and on the transcriptome. And this will all enter into the armamentarium of the physician in the hospital to allow him to approach the patient in a more personalized way. Now, let me give you an example. How much time do I have more? Nobody knows. Well, when you stop me, you stop me. So the current medicine is the medicine of pajama. What is a pajama? Pajama is something that we never go to the tailor to, to make. Why? Because there are Three sizes, that's all. That's what you will find in a store. You'll find small, medium, and large. And the rest is for the rubber band to accommodate to your size. It's not like a suit. Current medicine is exactly like a pajama. We cannot tailor it to the individual. We tailor it to a big population. So if a patient, for example, has a breast cancer, for us, the breast cancer is a lump in the breast that need to be taken out. So we bring in the surgeon. And the surgeon takes it out. And then we add some therapy, like chemotherapy or radiotherapy. And we hope for the good. But we only hope for the good. But we cannot predict the good. Let me just, these are, if you have a group of patients, take a group of patients today, this uh, Sunday, that are all diagnosed with a breast cancer, a group of women, or a man, that are all diagnosed with a prostate cancer, and they get the, what I call the pajama treatment, and now we start to follow them. And we start to follow them, so in five years, typically for oncologists, five years is the sign whether the patient is free of the disease or not. So if after five years the patient is completely healthy, no disease signs, things are fine. If by five years the patient has an accelerating downhill disease, or the patient is dead, then we didn't succeed. So a group of patients start the treatment. Today, Sunday, August 26, 2012. And on Sunday, August 26, 2017, we are going to monitor the result of our treatment. And we shall see that about 80% of them were cured. Depends on the cancer. I can tell you, if it's a brain cancer, nobody will be here. 
If it's a pancreas cancer, nobody will be here. If it's a breast cancer, yes, many will be here. So it depends on the disease. So let's take a disease that is divided somehow, and about some patients are here. Here means they're out. Now, what happened to us? What is it that on day one, we could not predict the outcome of the treatment and of the disease? Simply because we bought them a pajama. We didn't buy them a suit. We did not have, at this day, a molecular spectacles to tell us exactly that this patient is going to develop an aggressive disease. While well, this patient is not going. We are color-blinded. We cannot make a distinction nowadays for most of the diseases. And it's not only cancers. It's Alzheimer and, uh, and many other diseases between patients that will be cured, that will be benefited from the disease, and patients that the treatment is not going to help them. We are starting to get an idea, but we are only at the beginning. And let me show you an example. In breast cancer, here it is. You have two biopsies here. These are two biopsies taken from two women. And you can see that woman B has something here that woman A doesn't have. Something is stained with an antibody to an estrogen receptor, to a mutated estrogen receptor. This woman has a mutation, which is a driver mutation, but the mutation is at the DNA level. We need to go to the DNA of this woman in order to understand it. And we can stain the mutated estrogen receptor. This woman doesn't have it. This woman can be treated with a drug called tamoxifen, which is an anti-estrogen receptor. This woman, it will be waste to treat her with tamoxifen. Not only waste of money, but mostly waste of hopes because she doesn't have the cause of the disease that tamoxifen treats. So why to treat her with tamoxifen? And the same is true for the estrogen receptor, for the progesterone receptor, and the same is true for the EGF receptor. I can show you another example of a drug for breast cancer, which is called Herceptin. This is an antibody against a mutated HER2 receptor, but not all women have HER2 receptor. Some have mutated HER2 receptor and some don't. Some have mutated estrogen receptor and some not. Some have a, a mutated the pro, a, a, a HER2 receptor and some not. And some are, th those that don't have any of the three, the progesterone, the estrogen, and the HER2 are called triple negative. And those ones, we simply don't know what to do with them. And they turned out to be the most aggressive behaving tumors. They are called triple negative or TNs. So here you get a glimpse into personalized medicine. We take the biopsy, we go to the markers that we know, and we treat the woman, woman A, not because she had a lump in the breast, but because she has a lump that has a mutation in a certain molecule. Now, these three mutations in the estrogen, progesterone, and EGF receptor, the HER2 receptor, were discovered by smart people by chance. Now we want to discover all the mutations in a systematic way. We want to take 1,000 and 2,000 women with breast cancer and sequence them all, all the DNA, and get a landscape of the entire repertoire of the mutations that they have. Again, this is not a drug. This is A out of the alphabet, only the letter A. Because the mutations we have to um, still distinct between driver mutation and hitchhikers, hitchhikers, some of them are driving the process, some of them are just secondary. Um, we have then to understand how the mutation affects the protein. Then we have to go to the bench and take a good chemist with us, a good uh, um, organic uh, uh, synthetic chemist, to develop a drug that will fit into the mutated protein. Then we have to try the drug on mice, and then we have to go to women to, to, women, to see that it's not toxic, and so on and so forth. So the road is long and bumpy, but at least we can draw a road map. We have a roadmap, and the roadmap starts with the DNA and go via all what I told you. So this is the revolution of personalized medicine. It's not a revolution that will start like a tsunami, like an earthquake, like a war. It's coming. It's coming with the unraveling of a marker after a marker after a marker. It's going in parallel in different places in the world, in different laboratories. We now discover the marker. He now discovered the marker. She now discovered the marker. It's coming. Uh, I don't know when it will come to a completion. I don't think that it will ever come to a completion. But we are already there at a slow pace 
The limiting factor is still the DNA, the mass DNA sequencing that I believe is like maybe two years behind the corner. We are really there and very quickly so. Now, let me conclude with one important slide, maybe the most important one. And this slide tells us that there are no free lunches. We don't eat for free. And everything comes with a price. I'm going over some of the important stuff. I will bring the presentation with me tomorrow so we can delve into a, a more discussion tomorrow. Now, there are no free lunches. And there are no free lunches. We have to pay for each revolution. And we are paying for everything. We are, uh, by inventing the car, we introduce to our world road accidents. Go to a hospital, go to the orthopedic ward, and you will see, uh, besides cemeteries, you will see lots of broken people hanging up uh, from all kinds of different beds that the orthopedic surgeons are treating them, and neurosurgeons are treating them. We smoke, we have lung cancer. For every, everything we are paying, we developed the industry, we brought contamination. So we are paying. We are paying, we are going to pay heavily for the revolution of personalized medicine. And let me just point out for you some of the points, and then if you want, we shall go ahead and broaden them and deepen them tomorrow. As I said, many diseases, mostly metabolic, like diabetes and psychiatric, are multigenic. And the causative connection between the genes products is not clear. So, you know, as I told you, it's not one gene, one mutation, one disease. This was the picture of genetics until the 60s and the 70s. It's clearly not now anymore. There are multi-genes. Each of them have different penetrants. There is an interplay between the penetrants of the genes. And it will be very difficult to understand. We shall need vast statistics, vast statistics. On top of it, obviously, there is the environment. Uh, the environment also has huge effect on our um, health, um, our health state. Uh, in the East, you are all coming from the East. You used to have very good food. Now you are contaminated by McDonald's and all the other uh, junk that you infected yourself from the United States. So God will bless you for that. Keep on uh, eating uh, hamburgers and uh, fried on deep uh, oil and uh, your arteries in the heart will be occluded nicely. But uh, environment, environment is a major factor, and as we pointed out. But multigenic diseases are going to be a slowing factor in our understanding uh, pathogenetic mechanisms. Malignancies are characterized by genomic instability, and therefore targets are not stable. A typical case of a cancer patient, he will come to the doctor, will be diagnosed, Treatment will start, the treatment will help, the markers will go down, the tumor will regress, and then the tumor comes back again. Why? Because the genome of the tumor is unstable. I will not go into all the hallmarks of Weinberg and Hanahan, where to go and what to do um, about cancer, but, but one of the hallmarks of cancer, that the genome is unstable, and once you are pressing against one mutation with a drug, another mutation will come. Therefore, Many people, including myself, don't see any chance that cancer will ever be hit by one drug. It will always be a combination of drugs that will try to attack the disease from different uh, uh, directions. Cancer is like water. You know, water comes underneath the door. If you shut the door, it will come from the electric outlets. If you shut the electric outlets, it will flow through the window. It will always find a way to come in. So this is a major problem for us in treatment, because we never know what will be the next mutation. So this is another. So we, we identify a mutation in the patient, but as we go, the same very patient will evolve additional mutation, rendering him or her resistant to the progression of the disease. Now, human experimentation is awfully complicated. You know it. There are many lawsuits against companies. We can mention them uh, uh, later. Um, and companies are, are considering whether to go into an area or not to go into an area. And many drugs were removed from the shelf because of lawsuits. And uh, this interplay, sensitive interplay between, between lawsuits and, uh, and the ability of people to sue companies that are from time to time negligent. I'm not uh, trying to protect them, but there is a limit to it. 
took from the shelf excellent drugs, I can tell you. Millions of people are suffering because 10 other people decided to go to the American court, and the American court decided against. So legal, uh, legal uh, liability of companies. The two other issues are very important. One is the end of blockbuster era. You know, many companies prefer to have one drug that they will sell for billions of dollars. From now on, there will not be one drug for, dr for breast cancer, or for prostate cancer, or for whatever. There will be breast cancer A, and breast cancer B, and breast cancer C, and D, and E, and F. And the drug companies will find themselves all of a sudden under an avalanche of, drug, of requirement for drug development. Because there will not be one population, there will not be a pajama anymore. There will be a tailor-made suit for the patient. And this will require that each tailor will tailor a suit for the proper patient, and we shall not be able to take one pajama and sell it to a large chunk of the population. And the last one is probably the most important one. And that, these are the bioethical issues. And the bioethical issues are really uh, uh, severe in that case because what we are doing, we are submitting our DNA and our most uh, reliable and most important intimate information to the doctor or to the hospital, doesn't matter. And you can say, okay, as a physician, I remember that during the last day before we got the license, we swore to the confidentiality of the patient. We shall not disclose the secrets of the patient. But this is nothing. Let's say the doctors are fine. The doctors are not the issue. The issue of what is in this information is a governmental issue. The government would like, maybe the government of Israel would like tomorrow to draft to the Israel Defense Forces the best soldiers. They would like to know who is the most intelligent and who is the most fitting and who is the most, and they would like to know it time ahead in order to plan, and they would like to go to the DNA. Why not? They can do it if they want. I don't know if it will be open for them. Insurance companies. Insurance companies would like to know whom to insure for one dollar a year and whom to insure for a million dollars a year. Because some of us will get heart attack and some of us will live forever. Actually, now I'm sliding and I'm telling you that it may be at our interest to discover what's going on. Because why should I, a healthy person, share my policy, my insurance policy with somebody here who is prone to have Alzheimer, become crazy, depressed, suicidal, and knock his car in a road accident every other week? Why should I? So, but now I want to show you how it crawls even deeper into our life. And I'll give you two examples and end with that. Show you that it's not the insurance companies, and it's not the doctor, and it's not the government, it's us. I give you an easy, a light example. Here in Israel, a woman at the age of 40, a religious woman, a mother of six kids, got polycystic kidney disease, PKD. It's a disease in which the kidneys are developing cysts and gradually lose their function, so that at the end, she has to go on dialysis and or to get a transplant. The best donor to the transplant is her brother. Her brother is 23 years old, I'm telling you a story. He just got married, he had a child of one year old, and he knows about the problem in the family and he decides to go away. He hides somewhere in the southern part of this country, near Eilat, in Israel. He doesn't want to hear from the family. He doesn't want any connection with the family. He doesn't want to know anything. Why? He knows that he's a potential donor to the sister. The problem with him is not that he's afraid to give the kidney. It doesn't matter. He can give the kidney. The problem is that before giving the kidney, he must undergo a test to know whether he has the disease. Because if he has the disease that will be developed later on, then he cannot give the kidney because the disease, the kidney will develop the disease. He can give the kidney only if he is healthy. So basically, for him, it's a Russian roulette. We have to come to him, a young family, and tell him we want a sample of blood of yours to know whether you have the mutation for PKD. Now, if you don't have it, fine, you will give a kidney. But if you have it, you are now healthy. But every day, every day when you walk up, you'll wake up and you'll feel something, that your head is aching, that, that your finger is itching, you will think, wow, here is the disease coming. 
you will know for sure that you are going to have the disease. Some people don't want to play this game. In this case, it's ended up happily. It's a religious family. They are, have to abide by the rabbis. I don't want to go into all the details. He is healthy, and he gave the kidney to the, his sister, and everybody is happy. Now I'll give you a problem that you'll never be able to solve. Not you, me. A woman at the age of 50 undergoes breast cancer operation. Simple. It happens every day in this country to about 20 women. 20 to 25 women in Israel every day are undergoing breast cancer operation. And Israel is only 7 million. Now multiply it by the population of Taiwan, which is what, 23 million, will be close to 100 women. Multiply it by the population of Japan, which is 120 million, get the number. Go to China, multiply Japan by another 15, you'll get China. And you will see what's going on. Now, a woman undergoes an operation, and everything is fine. The tumor is going away, is being cut away, and she doesn't have any metastasis. And then, after she is uh, recuperating, the doctor gives her a call and said, you know, I want to run on you one test. I want to know whether you have a mutation in a gene called BRCA1, breast cancer number one. It's the name of a gene, a real gene. This is, I'm not telling you fables. I'm telling you genetic realities. And BRCA1 is a gene that if you have a mutation in, you are susceptible to breast cancer. The woman will say, but I had a breast cancer, and my breast was taken away, so what do I care? The doctor tells her, but you have another breast. Wow, that's a problem. Let's say that the woman is 50 years old, the husband is understanding, she understands the genetic information, everything. She is ready to take the second breast. Here is the sign for me to stop. 60 more seconds. <laughs> and uh, the second breast is going out. The doctor tells her this is not the end of the story. The gene carries a susceptibility. Did I deter you? Did I send you back to your? Ah, Iran is there. <laughs> Here is my threat. The doctor tells her the breast cancer one gene carries susceptibility to ovarian cancer. Your ovaries have to be removed if you choose so. Now, ovarian cancer is a different story than breast cancer. It's a deadly disease. This is a deadly disease. Women are dying almost 100% after because it's growing in the abdomen. It's typically diagnosed too late. I don't want to go into it. The woman still will go to it. She doesn't need her ovaries anymore. She has three daughters. She is beyond her fertility age. She is ready to take her two breasts. One breast was taken. The second was taken by choice. The two ovaries are taken by choice. The problem is over. Forget about it. Now starts the problem. She has three daughters. What to tell the daughter? The daughters may carry the gene. Now, this is the problem to which we don't have a, an answer. If she doesn't tell the daughters anything, she knows that her daughters are carrying a ticking bomb. One of them is in high school, one of the daughters. Another one is in the military, and another one is just got married. They are carrying a ticking bomb. It, if she warns them, OK, don't do anything to your breast. Just go to an annual or semi-annual examinations. Can you imagine the trauma? And can you imagine what the boyfriend or the fiance or the husband of the, one of the daughters will say? Whom did I marry? A ticking bomb. Now, I'm not, again, I, I didn't come to frighten you, and I didn't, I just want you to know that the genetic testing has a price, and we as a society will have to tackle it one way or another. Being knowledgeable means also being troublesome. Thank you very much.